So we're going to talk about our optimization project. Uh, our project basically was to optimize the trajectory of a rocket being launched into space. Today, we're pretty much going to talk about our process of creating the optimization function and the results we got. I'm Adam Jackson. And I'm Mark Anderson. So kind of like I was saying, our objective of this project was to minimize the amount of fuel required to launch a payload into orbit. Uh, this is really relevant today as the amount of satellites being launched into space is ever increasing. Uh, it's predicted over the next 10 years that there's going to be around 990 launches each year. Um, and there's also lots of small rocket startups uh, contributing to the increase of uh, satellites being launched. So optimizing the, the amount of fuel consumed will reduce the price of launching rockets as well as reduce pollution. And again, like Adam was saying, this is particularly impactful for a lot of small rocket companies that maybe don't have as many resources as some of the larger companies do. And if we take a look at from their perspective, it would be very beneficial to be able to analyze these types of trajectories very quickly, be able to find a very good starting point for a lot of their higher fidelity simulations. It's also beneficial to the general public and others who are interested in sending things to space because this type of analysis enables us to use less fuel, build smaller rockets, make those rockets cheaper, provide easier access to space, and it lets people from research teams, universities, and other groups be able to have much better access to put their equipment on top of a rocket. So first we're gonna talk about the rocket launch theory, how we came up with our equations. So when we initially set it up, we kind of modeled the Brachystercone problem where we set equal increments in Y and then we vary the, uh, the change in X. And we made an initial guess of about a parabola um, and then just kind of based our equations off of this trajectory and this change in X and change in Y. Uh, we started off balancing the forces and the main forces that we're going to take into account through our, our calculations are thrust, drag, and gravity. For gravity, we just assumed a constant gravitational acceleration of 9.8. We did not take into account like how gravitational acceleration changes the further away you are from Earth. But we did take into account that the mass of the rocket is changing as it launches into space and consumes fuel. We created models for drag. So we created a function that would take, uh, take data loosely based off of standard atmospheric models and calculate the drag force based off of velocity and altitude. So as you can see in the plot to the right, as you increase the velocity, it drastically increases the drag. But then as you really increase the height, the drag decreases. And this is because there's going to be less air resistance because there's less air. We did not, however, take into account supersonic wave drag. Uh, so to simplify our problem, we decided to assume a constant acceleration throughout the entire launch. And we chose 3G. Uh, 3Gs is the acceleration force or acceleration value. Um, and so now that we had our drag and gravitational forces, we were able to calculate the thrust required, um, and that's shown below. With, uh, with the thrust and our delta x and delta y, uh, we were able to calculate uh, how much force, uh, how much work needed to be done over the, each increment. And then we used conservation of momentum uh, using the uh, velocity of fuel exiting the rocket and its mass to estimate how much mass is consumed in each increment. And then we stored the values of the change in mass over each increment, summed them up, and that gave us the total fuel consumed over the entire launch. And now that we have kind of a physics-based simulation, we really want to be able to form optimizations on these trajectories and be able to minimize the amount of fuel that is consumed. Uh, it's important to note that in this analysis, we actually only simulate the fuel and we don't simulate the actual structure of the rocket. And so our final result where we show the amount of mass left over 
has to account for the total mass of the rocket as well as the mass of the payload. So our inputs right here, um, initially we started out by putting every single point in the trajectory as an input to our optimization. And to get to our desired altitude, that gave us like 270 points to optimize. And so we had 270 design variables and it was really cumbersome and awkward and very slow to work with. And something that the grader mentioned on our homework was that we should consider using splines instead, where we could only have a few points and then we could interpolate between those points. And that's exactly what we did. So right here in this diagram, we are actually only working with five input points and we are then interpolating 2000 points in between those. And this was very beneficial to us because the optimizer could run and uh, work faster with fewer variables. We also input these variables into the optimizer as the logarithm, the logarithm of the variables. Um, and that helped prevent any issues with scaling and set everything to order one. And like Adam was saying, what we have here is we're just inputting the X locations. And you'll notice that the Y locations are fixed at a particular uh, delta Y value between each point, but the X locations are the things that are varying. We decided to provide derivatives to our optimizer rather than having it automatically finite difference itself. And we decided to use the complex step method because it's very accurate. And in MATLAB, the auto diff 2016 was very slow when we used it for the homework. And so we decided that it would be beneficial to us to just use the complex step method which was also beneficial or useful because we had access to the source code, which we wrote. And so we could make sure that it worked. And we provided Jacobians for the objective, the objective function and both the inequality and the equality constraints. And we wanna take a few moments here to talk about the constraints that we had because each one of these was created in response to um, the optimizer exploiting basically a weird mode of our of our code where it could optimize the mass, but do something that wouldn't physically be the best in real life. And so we also used linear and nonlinear constraints. And the linear constraints, starting with linear inequality, we said that each spline node must be further downrange than the one before it. And that was in response to the optimizer trying to throw us on these zigzaggy paths up to space, which would be very hard to handle in terms of the the G's that you would be pulling and we don't see rockets do that. So we assume it's not, not the best idea. We also said that each successive difference between the nodes needs to be larger. And what that does is it helps us to make sure that we stay on a roughly, you know, parabolic or constantly curving trajectory. The linear equality constraint said that we need to have we need to end up at the endpoint specified by the user. And if we omit that, then the rocket ignores the initial trajectory guess basically and just says the optimal path to save fuel is to go straight up. And it works, but we wanted to go to orbit, not just go to space. And so we fix the endpoint and say that it has to go this way. So the nonlinear equality constraints. Uh, the start angle has to be less than five degrees, which corresponds to a vertical takeoff. And that was in response to the rocket trying to take off basically at a 45 degree launch angle, which considering that the mass of the rocket, it's not a small sounding rocket, it's a pretty big rocket, uh, that would be very hard to maintain and you'd have to orient the thrust in weird directions to try to get that to happen. And so we said it has to take off vertically. And each turn between the interpolated trajectory points can't exceed one degree. That's in response to once we set the end point, it tried to go straight up and then turn 90 degrees at the end. And we said that basically it has to be smooth throughout. It can't turn more than one degree at a time. And the last constraints, the nonlinear equality constraints, say that the final angle in the trajectory must be equal to the one specified by the user. And that prevents it from going far downstream and then turning straight up at the end to try and 
reach the desired point, but then you would no longer be in orbit because all your velocity is directed upwards. So some of these results that we'd like to share, we've got several cases is first off, we have the using the interior point algorithm. Uh, we use active set for one example in a few minutes that we'll show. And this is a, for an exit angle of 80 degrees. Notice that it first takes the trajectory guess that we gave it, makes it feasible according to our constraints, and then starts to optimize it. And you can see it's very fun to watch that final rocket mass increase. And again, we're actually minimizing the fuel, but what we're showing is the final rocket mass, which accounts for the mass of the structures and the payload. Example two, we are doing a very similar optimization right here, but we're using more data points. And it works very smoothly. It provides a very nice looking trajectory. And you can see that it is making it feasible and then making it optimal. Example three, we threw on even more data points and we found that instead of making it better, it actually gave it convergence issues and the first order optimality struggled to get below the, the threshold that we desired. And eventually it just quit because the step tolerance was, uh, it was below the threshold that we had set for the step tolerance. Example four, this is where we're gonna actually compare the interior point method to the active set method. And so we put in an initial guess, uh, kind of a, a logarithmic uh, shaped trajectory. And we see here that it immediately starts to optimize it. And we gain about 5,000 kilograms by optimizing this trajectory. Does that in 58 iterations and 97 function calls. If we do the exact same um, thing, but with the active set method, it does it in 15 iterations and 32 function calls. But notice how it kind of freaks out for a moment. This was something we ran into uh, in many of the um, in many of the optimizations. And when we kind of pinned down our code, we decided to use the interior point method because it avoided doing things like this. Even though active set could sometimes show that it was faster like this, it, we decided that it was, it would also sometimes get lost when it kind of freaks out like that and end up in a not very good trajectory. So when we're looking at this project and thinking about like, what's the next step? How could we improve this? One of the big first things we noticed is that our rocket doesn't end up reaching the orbital velocity that we wanted. So we calculated how fast it has to go. And it's about like 7,000 meters per second. And we only get to about halfway there. To get all the way there, we'd have to end up about 1,000 kilometers uh, away uh, in the X, uh, whereas in our simulation, we're not going quite that far simply because the simulation becomes less stable and has issues converging when we increase the total change in X to a thousand. Um, so pretty much we're calling this the first stage of a multi-stage rocket, like getting just to this point is optimal, but there's gonna have to be uh, more acceleration after that to finish getting into orbit. Um, other things that we wanna take into account in if we were to continue would be allowing for some sort of change in the vertical axis, kind of how we described it's currently set that the change, the change in Y is currently a set value. Um, if we could vary that, that, we think that would be interesting. Also accounting for supersonic wave drag where appropriate and um, something we want to investigate is the effects of drag on the trajectory, simply because we found that there was little, if any, change in the trajectory based off of whether we included drag or not. The total amount of mass consumed was changed, but uh, the trajectory was not. And so in conclusion, our optimizer does work and it shows hope for future better analyses that can be done. We can have better improved code, uh, the code again is modular and so it can, you can change out the drag function and all these different things. Uh, we were able to input something that's infeasible and have it become feasible and that was good. And then this type of analysis could be easily recreated at one of these startup rocket companies. Um, and it could again serve as a very good starting point for some initial analyses and with improved estimates for mass and drag and all of these different you know, engine performance, this could become a very nice simulation. And that's it. Thanks for listening. I'm Mark. Thank you. I'm Adam. I hope you have a great rest of your day.